I'm Angie Butler. It's Thursday the 28th of November 2019 and today I'll be in conversation with Tim Hopkins from Half Pint Press. So did making printed work start with the acquisition of your press? Not quite. Uh, fairly shortly after I got married uh, my wife and I decided that for fun more than anything else we would go and do a, an evening, six evenings uh, introduction to letterpress at uh, Central St Martins in London oh. and that was that was as much because we knew uh, they were moving right. and you know knowing knowing a bit about the storied history of that institution yeah. we thought it would be fun to go and actually be students there albeit sort of pretend students so we went and did an introduction to letterpress and um, everyone wanted to use the van der Cook and the Adana was largely free so I just, you know, I did my little, whatever it was, business card or whatever on the Adana. Okay. And shortly after that, uh, literally a couple of weeks after that, my big brother, who's a massive bibliophile, um, phoned me up and said, uh, I, I, bought this, I bought this press for 30 quid from a junk shop. Was it any use to you? And I said, yeah, all right. I can. He, he gave it to me on permanent loan, semi-permanent loan. I don't, I don't think he's going to ever Not have it back, it back now. now. <laughs> no. no. So, but, but um, um, you know, the, I, I printed maybe two things before the Adana arrived. Yeah, and that's the press you've got, an Adana, which for people who are maybe not quite sure is a small tabletop clamshell platen press. That's right. Um, and and eight, so, so maximum, absolute maximum printing area, eight inches by five inches, um, but to print acceptably the the area that you can you can really print with is much smaller than that. And do you print exclusively on your Adana press? Almost. Okay. The most recent thing I've done, mm -hmm. which is an edition of a book called Imaginary Letters by a um, modernist writer called Mary Butts, is literally all done on an Adana apart from the illustration on this one and that illustration was screen printed after a after an illustration by the illustrator but the, the text is the text is done on an Adana mm -hmm. in this case in order I mean this ordinarily this would be too much text to print even to this mediocre quality on an Adana so um, this this section was printed in two strokes, so I was um, in order to keep the quality of the print up. I, I would split things up, sometimes paragraph by paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, and Tim's being very modest; he's a very good printer. <laughs> um, so, do you, you find um, saying like almost exclusive? That's one thing out, yeah. out of lo a lot of work that you've got. Do you find it constraining in any way? Uh, or do you like working with constraints? Them constraints are useful in my yeah. view. So uh, it means that I can't do absolutely anything that I feel like doing at any given point. So if I want to make something that has a particular effect, I have to think about how I'm going to do that within the within the constraints that working with a almost toy equipment gives me. Like you've said, printing. So with with this with this text, one, absolutely, you, you would set it up twice. Exactly. So, so the, on this on this half page, the first paragraph and the third paragraph were on were on um, were set up in one form, and then the central paragraph was set up on a separate one, which meant that I had to be very careful with the printing. There was quite a lot of wastage because, I mean, the press is only what well, it's uh, sixty centimeters by. 30 centimetres by 50 centimetres or something. It's not a very big press. So a piece of paper this big, which is something like 70 by 20, yeah. actually doesn't properly fit on the press anyway. So I was having to perform this sort of gymnastic <laughs> gymnastic approach of holding it firm on the press. And then, yeah. and then I don't know, with the third hand I was pressing it. I don't know, I can't, can't quite remember how it happened. Mm. Um, it happened slowly and with lots of waste and a good deal of swearing. <laughs> <laughs> so... So why books? Um, I am a um, I'm somebody who likes to, likes text. I'm, yeah. I'm I live in a world of words more than a world of pictures in inside my head and outside my head. Um, you know I I'm I really like 
I really like visual art. I, some visual art, not all visual art, obviously. Um, you know, I, I look at a lot of printmaking. I have, yeah. um, I have particular favourite printmakers, but my imagination tends to be most fired by text. So when I started printing, I naturally gravitated to text. The other thing is I'm no sort of a drafts person at all. I really, um, I, I really can't draw. I like to think I've got a bit of an eye for, for the layout of a page. But, you know, um, mm -hmm. using, using text to do a thing on a page is, is what I found myself most interested in doing. So I started... When I when I got the when I got the press, I didn't really I hadn't thought that I would be making books. A sort of absurd hobby of uh, hobby of you know using using a press to using a tiny press to make these these you know full length books in some cases. Um, I was I was playing with making beer mats. Yeah. I was running a club on a Sunday afternoon, and so I used to have these sort of handmade beer mats that we'd just hand out. So you know people would. It was nice making ephemera anyway, but that, they were almost all entirely text-based, so I'd use text in hopefully imaginative ways. Um, and it was just it was just the thing. It was something that I was doing for fun, yeah. but you know also helped with the remind people that we were playing records in this place. Um, yeah, and so it was it was that that sort of that turned into okay. I I want to use text here. I got used to using text mm -hmm. as opposed to you know making. And having read, having images made up. Do you read, read a lot as well? I do read a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I don't really know how to quantify a lot, but <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's always there's always a book on the go. So, just the book that's at the top here. Yeah. Um, I just want to read out so so people kind of get a, a little insight. The Book of Disquiet, which is the book on the left and various, um, builds from the unique history, form and content of Fernando Pessoa's classic of the same name, uh, which was found in fragments in a box in the author's room after his death. Tim has taken 61. There are 60, there were supposed to be six, there were supposed to be 60, but I lost count. <laughs> so 61 of these fragments and presents them letterpress printed on a variety of ephemera to create a reading experience that adds to the feeling and atmosphere of the novel itself. So do you find texts to fit ideas or do the ideas come from the text that you read? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, when I set out this, the, the book of Disquiet was the first book work that I embarked on, um, without really knowing what it meant. I just started doing it, and you know, without without a clear plan in mind, um, I, as discussed, have this this little press, which means that I wasn't in a position of doing you know full registers of 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 um, text and making proper proper bound books. So I started thinking about what I could do that was um, that, that was more substantial than just sort of giving beer mats out to people. So I, you know um, that, that, that that sense of well, I know I'm not I'm not going to be able to do I'm not going to be able to do a, a full length book in the traditional way. But how can I how can I use text in a fragmentary form? to produce something that's interesting. Um, the Book of Disquiet is a long-term favourite of mine. I've known it since early 90s, I guess, early mid 90s. I think I picked up a copy in a long, long dead bookshop in Preston, Lancashire. Um, and so I started to think, well, hold, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the classic um, B.S. Johnson um, book in a box called The Unfortunates, which is a book that you can read in any order. Every chapter is on a is on a separate piece of paper, and you can pick them up. And realizing the history of this particular text, which is that it was fragmentary, it was never finished. It was found in it was found in a disordered state after Pessoa's death. Um, those thoughts seem to come together and sort of be an opportunity. Um, so in that case. The idea that the the, the 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 idea of doing something fragmentary found the text that was fragmentary, and then they sort of worked together, put it back in a box, you know, um, 
the, the, the book of disquiet as sort of reflections and thoughts through the life of a of, of the of the central character, semi-autobiographical. So the idea of actually then writing it across objects which appeared to be sort of randomly collected from life seemed to seem to seem to be the right thing to do for that text. Um, for a different text, you'd take a different approach. So growing together is the idea. I've got a quote here by you. Oh, <laughs> I apologise in advance. There is a melancholy sense of sifting through the relics of a life lived, full of unreachable connections. Yeah. Can you respond to that? <laughs> yes, uh, certainly. Um, part of the thinking was, I mean, this was, this was a box that they found in Purcell's room, blah, blah. Um, I know that I have several cardboard boxes littered around my home, which are full of things which are neither beautiful enough to show, important enough to display, not really important enough to file in any meaningful sense, but important enough to me to want to keep them and not just, not just chuck them away. You know, um, marry, condo, be damned, and all that. Um, so that feeling of, of going through your stuff and there being lots of, lots of memories triggered, um, I think is, was, was quite an important thought in my mind when we were when I was doing this. Um, plus, uh, going through other people's boxes like that <coughs> is, a, is a weirdly fascinating thing to do. So some things appear to be utterly blank and meaningless, but you know, as you're looking through them, because they've saved them, they've got some, they've got some emotional resonance for, for that other person. Uh, so I started thinking, well, if I can make if I can make this box feel like that, so that so that as the reader you're picking bits up, you're you're getting the idea that because you've because somebody's bothered, gone to the trouble of saving this thing, uh, that it must have some it must have some import, some weight. Then that is where the atmosphere of the thing comes from. So. Each, it's not just the words that make the thing feel important to the reader. It's the it's the fact that it's on a thing, which I mean, you know, I mean, you know, bus tickets or old um, napkins, um, cocktail bar napkins. You know, total throwaway nonsense. Uh, so, so it, it was a. It, my idea was, and hopefully it worked, that it was it was about building that atmosphere of precious, unprecious things. If you can get that atmosphere, then then it then, then the feelings deepened. And then I started thinking, well, um, I want to I want to pack if, if if I pack this thing as, as full as I can with my own sort of references and meanings, then people will be able to, to understand that that's true. People will feel that as they're reading it. So I, load, loads of the bits in here have, have particular special meanings to me. So for example, this, this beer mat, which is an example of the sort of thing that I would do on my beer mat printing days. Um, this was a set of blocks that I had hanging around the house after I made some beer mats for the wedding reception of uh, some friends of mine, Ed and Tara, surname Mason. Um, so this is the inside of uh, Finsbury Town Hall in London, which is where they had the reception. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, so I did that. Um, along the bottom of the wedding invite, it said Edward and Tara. This says Os Pedreros, which it, uh, Portuguese friends assure me means the Masons in Portuguese. Now, th that's a reference for me and for Ed and Tara, which is great. Uh, Nobody else is going to get that, or well, virtually nobody else is going to get that, and they're not going to pick it up. That's absolutely fine. It means something. People know that there are, people know that there's tons of meaning in there, and therefore, my thinking went: um, if you can, if you can, if people get that idea, then they're going to start to project their imagination onto those things. So my my favourite thing in in terms of reaction to this work, people say to me, and it's happened a surprising amount. People say to me, I know exactly why you put that thing on that. And I made a point of 
not deliberately relating the text that's in the fragment to the thing that I'm printing it on. I really wanted to keep that space open, avoid it being on the nose and try to engage the imagination of whoever, whatever poor soul was sifting through the thing. Mm -hmm. With one exception, I should add, and I just say this to make myself look good. So this is a, this is a set of uh, negatives from somebody's wedding. I think somewhere in Scotland in the 1970s, and I bought them. I bought I bought you know 100 and something of them in order to print this. And I, it's a pretty miserable book, the Book of Disquiet. It's not a cheery. It's not a cheery uh, tome. Uh, but the fragment I printed on here was one of the cheerier because it felt like really bad faith to put some you know miserable piece of doominess on somebody's wedding <laughs> negatives. Negatives though they are. <laughs> Can I ask um, about sort of engagement with your books? How, how do you see them being engaged with? Are they books to just look at? Are they books to touch? Are they books to read? Tell us how about engagement with them or any other stories, engagement. My dream is for people to read them. I really want, I, and when I'm making actually any of these, any of the things you can see in here. I've got an idea in my head, vague sometimes, but an idea in my head uh, of how people can read the thing. So the Book of Disquiet, literally nobody I know who likes that book thinks it's a book to be read from cover to cover. Um, so the Book of Disquiet, the idea was, well, you wouldn't read it all at once. You would, you, you take one out, one, you know, one a day. When you've got, got half an hour, you pick a few more or less at random and see what, I mean, that's how I read my copy of the book. Um, if I look at this one, so this is a, oops. that's your copy anyway, Sarah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this was a, this is a short story presented as a, as if it were a seven inch single which was the result of a conversation that I and some friends had about how you never get stories as singles. I mean, you do a bit in chat books and whatnot, but very rarely they come as, you know, you get, you get a kind of concept album, which is a novel, or you get a, an anthology of short stories, which is like a compilation album, but stories are never singles. And so from that thought, this story happened to be called Dusty Springfield. Um, and so the, the text is set in a circle, as you can see, but in order to read it, you have to spin it like a record, right? So the, it, it, you're necessarily engaging with it in a, in a tactile way, obviously, but, you know, actually you're reading it like a record, which is a sort of a cheap shot, but, you know, fun, nevertheless. Um, imaginary Letters, which is, which is this, that is a novella that comes in an order. So, so there has to be some way of guiding people from the start to the finish, you know, so the novel from the 20s. Um, I made it so it's virtually impossible to read on the bus. You'd have to be a lunatic to, to take it out of the house and read it. Mm -hmm. So in my head, you really have to find a space, clear a space, probably with a table in front of you, get the, get the each letter out. Once you've, so the way this, sorry, hold on. The way, this, the way this book works is it is in a series of eight letters, each of which comes in its own numbered envelope, um, which, is then, which are then presented in a, in a little cover like this and then tied up with a little bow so it looks sort of precious. Um, once you've opened an envelope, once you've opened one of these envelopes, there is no indication which letter it is. So, it says number one on the on the envelope, but if you so if you've got more than one letter open at any given point, you have to be really careful if you don't know the novella terribly well that it goes back in the right envelope. So I'm guiding people through to doing them one at a time. When I read the novel, when I read the novella in its in its um, in its bound form, I uh, I I felt like the letters were not necessarily different enough from each other. So you, I just read it straight through 
in one go and actually part of the thing of the text is times passing and the narrating character's views are changing through the course of the novel so so sort of teasing out teasing out a difference between between one letter and the next and giving each its own sort of atmosphere was quite important to me and and um so i wanted to make it i wanted to make the a, a sort of physical process of I'm stopping reading this letter and I'm starting reading the next one, which was involve it, which would involve you know folding it back up, putting it back in the envelope, taking another envelope. Um, so yeah, so yeah, you know I, I do have an idea of how it's to be read, and then once that's happened, the you know hopefully some sort of atmosphere is being generated by the fact it's you know laid out like a bag of spanners. Just to give a bit more info, so Mary Butts, yeah. <clears throat> 1890 to 1937, was an English modernist who published several novels and short stories. Imaginary Letters dates from 1928 and takes the form, as Tim's already said, of eight letters uh, addressed by an unnamed narrator to the imagined mother of Boris Polterasky, a white Russian exile living in living a bohemian life in Paris. The narrator loves Boris, but it quickly becomes clear that Boris's interests lie elsewhere. So these works are complex, containing many printed fragments using some unusual substrate. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, do you have a complete idea of how the finished work will look, or do you develop the work as it goes along. Tell me a bit about the process. That it develops as it goes along. Right. Um, when I started Imaginary Letters, I knew it was going to be eight letters in eight envelopes. Yeah. Uh, past that, I didn't have any idea. So my the, the process of that went well. I want each letter to be to to be a bit different. I, I mean, I, you know, as, as I was talking about, I want the experience of each one to be different enough that you'll know you're reading a different letter. So I sort of planned out, you know, I, I, I wanted the first and the last um, hotel foyo note paper that I've got here. Uh, I had um, one of the best printers in England, Graham Moss, from the Incline Press in Oldham. I had him do a, a, as close as he could manage to a facsimile of the actual note paper of the hotel that Mary Butts was staying at when she wrote the letter, which I, I happened to find a, um, a picture of online. And I said, Graham, can you, can you, how close can you get to this? So, so the first one and the last one, I wanted to be on Foyo note paper to give it a kind of anchoring. And then I thought through the different sorts of things that I could do to try to generate a bit of different atmosphere in each one. So it starts off being quite, um, I've, I've tried to have it start off being quite exuberant. So the, the first one and the second one, there's lots of bits of drawing on it. The, the typography's, I mean, typography's fun. I thought it was fun. It's kind of a bit annoying to do. So this page that you see will have been through the press uh, five times, so I'll have set that one printed on there, literally just turned it round, mm. sat it on exactly the same point in the press, printed that one and just, just slowly turned it, turned it around again. It's one of the things you can do with, a, with an Adana. Um, and then the illustration was a line drawing that I had made into a block and then, and then printed at some point after. Um, so it starts off exuberant, and then actually, the, as, as the as the her dream of the affair sort of peters out, then it becomes less exuberant, and that, that that's the that's the atmosphere that I'm trying to get. So I've thought through paper and layout, and uh, paper and layout and sequence in a sort of broad way, and then it was about finding the right paper for each one and working out working out how that rough idea was actually going to come to life. Also talking to the illustrator about how the layout might work and what she had in mind, and that, that was a, an interesting and uh, productive, uh, creative relationship. Um, this one, on the other hand, The Book of Disquiet, that was, so I set off with the idea that oh, I, I got permission from the publisher to do a 60 fragment thing, and don't tell him I did 61. Um, 
And then it was about what can I find. Fairly early in the process, um, I, initially I thought, oh, I'm just going to find lots of interesting bits of paper to print on. Um, this, was the, this was the one. This was the one that, that sort of set my set it on a slightly different course, which I found I found a couple of hundred of these Ag for Colour slides from somebody's somebody's holiday to Scandinavia. Um, and you know, had fun setting one of the shorter fragments in the space uh, that the slide provided so it looked like an integral part of this. And it suddenly occurred to me that it didn't just have to be on, you know, drinks labels and and napkins, there, there's a whole world of stuff. So, you know, hence I, people like this one, hence I, the, the pencil. So this, this was a, frag, a six line fragment, five line fragment with each line on a different side of a, of a, of a um, just a regular pencil. Uh, pencils are differently hard on different sides. That's what I found out. Lots of pencils died in the making of this one. <laughs> Um, but that, obviously that's a different print per side, so it involved, I, set up, I made a little jig out of uh, beer mats, funnily enough, lots of spare ones around the house. Uh, and I sort of, I taped them together so that they, they made a nice little sort of V of the right size, which meant that the V of the pencil would sit comfortably against the, against the press. So it would be, it would be held consistently. And then I had to, I actually moved the type up and down rather than the, rather than the jig because it was I had more control, resetting the type. You know, if, if it was a few millimeters too high to hit the pencil, I would actually have to just. It was easier to move the type than move the pencil. Um, that was the kind of fun, fun times. And how many pencils? I think I made. I set off with about 220 <laughs> to, in order to make 80 acceptable pencils. Wow. So you really have to, as you're, as you're, it, you need to be pressed hard enough to make enough of an impression on what can be quite hard wood to, for, the ink to, for the ink to stay. Uh, but if you press too hard, the pencil effectively explodes, is what I found out. Uh, which actually comes as a bit of a shock, so it, it's a sort of judging judging how hard to press and, and there's no way of predicting how hard any given side of a pencil is going to be because of the because they don't cut them according to the grain of the wood there we are pencil so that so in 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 terms of making this i would i actually would find myself sort of waking up as, as i was waking up in the morning and i'd find an idea for oh, there's, there's a thing i'd effectively be dreaming uh what things could I find in the world that I could possibly, I could possibly sort of repurpose for part of this book? There's lots of stuff in there. But that leads me quite nicely <laughs> on to the next question, which is, you know, uh, why letterpress printing, maybe digital printing, would um, would suit some of the substrates in an easier, more kind of complete sense? Um, so tell us about your relationship, why letterpress? Letter partly because I'm using this slightly shonky equipment, uh, partly because I'm not a terribly accomplished printer, and I certainly wasn't when I started this off. I mean, one of the, one of the stories of this, if you, knew which order, if you knew which order it was in, or which order I printed it in, you would see the printing hopefully get better over the course of the 60 fragments. Um, the, 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 the hand of the printer is definitely visible in the work. So the, the imperfections that exist in the work are part of that. Um, a part of, the, a part of the, the whole, sorry, part of the whole atmosphere of the thing. You can tell that you can tell that there are imperfections that are not generated that would be very hard to generate by digital process. I mean, it take twice as long to make the imperfections digitally. So that's all part of that sense of an atmosphere of about it being a thing that belongs to a real person. Both of these, both of these book works, both um, Book of Disquiet and uh, and Imaginary Letters have got. I mean, there's a fundamental problem, which is they're supposed to uh, they're supposed to evoke sen the sense of somebody writing to themselves. In my head, they're evoking the sense of somebody writing to themselves. But there's a fundamental problem with that because I'm using type, and you know that that people people don't write in type. Not many people. So so. I really wanted to, uh, the, the, the part that I had to find a way around that problem 
of um, this is a printed effectively it's a printed page I mean even the side of a pencil in this case is a printed page but I wanted people to by the time they were inside the book accept that this is actually something that you know the, the, the ephemera of somebody's everyday life which is clearly not a printed page so that sense of that sense of being relaxed about the imperfections um, was, was quite important. Uh, one of the things about one of the, one of the differences between these two is the book of disquiet. Um, one of the points of Fernando Pessoa's practice was he invented lots of different characters and wrote as lots of different characters. Um, so I was relaxed about using uh, multi multiple typefaces in. There's sometimes multiple typefaces in the same letter, same fragment rather. Um, for for imaginary letters, I have used the same face throughout. Um, again, to try to to to, although hopefully it feels like somebody's letters to themselves. It's that sense of this is this is her hand, her character. Is that it, makes sense. Is it like a voice then? Really, the type is finding the right typeface is a voice. I really? suppose so. Yeah. The imaginary letters. That's, at, at least, at least, if I'd used different types per letter, that would have been, that would have run the risk of making it more like type and less like, less like somebody, you know, the, the sort of integral product of a human being. Um, so, I mean, the, the type I used was the modern number one, which is a nice, nice sort of. Uh, it's called modern, but it feels pleasingly old-fashioned. So. It's supposed to feel like it's her hand, even though clearly it's a nice, neat type. Um, I wouldn't be terribly interested in sort of getting blocks made of handwritten work and sort of doing letters in that in that fashion, because I just think that would be too on the nose. It's just too bleeding obvious. It's not, you know, they have to be honest about what they are. But if what they are can conjure that sense of atmosphere that you're looking at somebody's real stuff, that's a that's a, a, a an imaginative space that I am really interested in opening up. Whereas if you, it feels like you're just leafing through someone's old letters, that actually sort of closes the imaginative space down in a funny sort of way. So it's all about that. It's all about that uh, that imaginative space that allows the reader to 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 get dreaming, dive in. Yeah. With the Pessoa and the imaginary letters, because they're a few mm. years apart, can you tell us how long it took from start to finish with the process? It took me, in the end, something like 18 months to get permission to do the Pessoa thing. Mm. Not because anyone was unhelpful particularly, but because I started off not asking the right people and then, frankly, some weirdo asking for permission to do this weird thing never made it to the top of anyone's to-do list for a little while. Serpent's Tale in the end was super nice and super helpful and gave me permission to do that. Once I had permission, it took about 18 months from start to finish. But, I mean, as, as mentioned, part of, the, part of the project was finding the things. So, it, I, theoretically, it could have been quicker if I, you know, if I was just printing on a, a pile of, of paper that I was ordering week by week. But some of the time... I was waiting for things to arrive or waiting for good ideas because I didn't just want to print on just anything. Um, imaginary letters took, I, I guess I'd been fit, sort, of, sort of thinking about it for nine months or a year before I started printing and then it took roughly 18 months. I actually finished, finished the um, compiling and, and uh, doing, the, doing the cover for the last one this week. So that's almost exactly 18 months. I know, I've finished. Mm -hmm. I don't have to look at it again for a bit. Um, so yeah, 18 months of, of evenings and weekends. So I work full time is something that I should have said before. Um, so this is, this is done on uh, in my spare time. That, that was going to be my next question, oh, actually. No, no, it, um, <laughs> it, it fits in really nicely because like, like practically all of us, yeah. um, you don't make your work full time. Right. Um, so could you tell us, obviously you, you work full time, yeah. could you tell us what job you do and how your practice fits around your work? I work for uh, Transport for London, uh, helping 
people who run projects on mostly on the streets uh, work out exactly how work out how they can be sure that the thing that they're trying to do is going to be as beneficial as uh, as they want it to be. So it's about analysing. Well, you know, it, it's called cool. it's called cool benefits, and it's about it's about saying, you know, are we are we clear that this project's going to make people safer or going to help the buses run a bit faster or going to slow the traffic down at this point or that point in order to make in order to save lives. So that's what I do on a daily basis. That has virtually nothing. I can't really think of anything that has to do with my with my printing work. So I, it, it, I mean, it, the printing fits around my day job. Um, it's one of the reasons why it's really nice to work from home. One of the reasons why, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine having the energy, frankly, to um, make a make the. I mean, the, my nearest. Letterpress Studio would be uh, the London Centre for Book Arts, I think, which is a, probably takes about an hour and twenty minutes to get to from from home. And I can't imagine after work hauling out to East London and doing that for you know a few hours and then hauling back home. That's just doesn't bear thinking about. Um, and equally, you know, it's really nice to roll out of bed on a Saturday morning uh, and be able to sort of start typesetting. I find typesetting really good as a hangover cure, incidentally. <laughs> if I've got a real stinker of a hangover, I can sit there and typeset for two or three hours, and by the end of that, I'm OK. <laughs> Sometimes, mostly. Um, so, yes, what was the question? <laughs> Sorry, I'm dreaming of drinking again. I think, I think you've answered. answered it. Good. <laughs> um, my last question, Tim. Yeah. Um, in 2017, um, the Book of Disquiet, which was your first major piece. Of it's the first book work of any kind that I've yeah. done. Yeah. It won the prestigious Minnesota Centre for Book Arts Prize. <laughs> what was it like being thrust into the limelight? And also, has it affected what you've done since? It was weird. I didn't, I mean, you know, I, the reason I entered the book for the prize was because the MCBA, the Minnesota Centre for Book Arts, have uh, they traditionally or every every time they've done one of those prizes, they had a really really good website. I'm not I'm not I wasn't I'm still not really very plugged into the general world of book arts. I'm not really I, I, I truthfully when I started the when I started the book of Disquiet, I didn't I wouldn't have been able to tell you what the discipline of book arts consisted of. I was just doing a thing. Um, so they had a really good website that, that you know all the entrants got pictures up on the site, and I figured that for the price of what was it thirty dollars or something, it was actually a really good way of having people that might be interested in this sort of thing see that this was going. I didn't dream that I would even make the shortlist. Genuinely, I thought you know, when I look at you look at some of the books in there. It's absolutely incredible work people do. Um, so I didn't think I was going to get nominated or get, get shortlisted for the prize. Uh, but I thought it might be helpful. Um, when I got shortlisted, that I was, you know, that that in and of itself was was uh, amazing and delightful. Um, my wife's family, or chunks of my wife's family, live not too far from from Minneapolis, so we were able to combine a family holiday. We were able to sort of sink the expense of of uh, of going to Minneapolis, combine it with our annual holiday. So I didn't feel too bad about that. Uh, and then, uh, truthfully, I don't really remember much about the evening that I won. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, that's partly because I drank a lot of beer, but I, it was, it was, uh, it was a, it was a rush of people talking to me. Damn, goodness knows what terrible nonsense I said. Um, so what was it like? It was extremely gratifying. It was, it was, you know, beyond any expectations and it felt really good that you know people thought that what I had done was interesting and original enough it's amazing what you can do when you don't know what you what you're doing um, so yeah it was amazing I don't I don't really feel like I've been meaningfully cast into any limelight but you know that that uh, yeah you know I don't it's, this is this is not this is not international fame but it's really nice it's it's lovely when I meet people who who've already come across the work before I meet them. Did it affect that? It probably made me confident enough to be 
a bit more ambitious in the in the in making imaginary letters, just to say, well, you know, uh, let the idea run, take as long as you need to do it, you know, have some faith that that this this rough idea that I've got will turn out to be will turn out to be good. So I don't know what it would have been like had I not had that extra little ego boost. I might have I might have abandoned at some point in the in the course because it, it was. It's quite a long and difficult process. I mean, there's, there's a lot of text in, in Imagine Letters, uh, and it took a long time without without any obvious indication that the whole thing was going to pull together into a into something that felt like a coherent whole. And that, I mean, that's that's common with both of those books. That there's that sense that I had set off to do this thing, but you know, if you look at you know, let's, let's say you've done 15 of those and you look at a box in your room with 15 piles of, you know, 80 or 90 of each of those things. It's a pretty unprepossessing sight. So that, that sense of, is this going to come together to be something that feels like I want it to feel? There's no way of knowing until you've done it. Uh, and the fact that this had happened made me confident enough to keep keep plugging away at that one. So... Well done, Tim. Thank you. And, um, Thank you. I wonder if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Tim. So you mentioned earlier on about uh, you got when you were getting permissions, you asked the wrong people. Who were the right people to ask? Uh, I. It, it was the wrong people. I was. I was. Uh, I was emailing some generalist. Uh, some generalist email address at Serpent's Tail. And then there, I think there was a change in the in the overall publisher, like the, the the head of the head of the publishing house. So I was sort of emailing this address that had ceased to exist. And then I had a, a lucky series of conversations uh, with somebody I knew who knew somebody there, uh, and they said, "Oh no, you need to you need to email such and such a person." So this sort of little string of the right people. Um, yeah, it, was, it took a little while. I, I, that, that, I don't. I, I, I would like to emphasise that Serpent's Tale was super helpful. It just it took these things always take longer than you hope. Question. Um, I liked what you were saying about rummaging through. Well, I don't know if you said rummaging through, but rummaging through other people's boxes of <laughs> yeah. ephemera, and I kind of yeah. wondered how you was that just people you knew, or yeah. how did you? How did it happen? Well, it. it uh, I mean, yes, people. I you know. Every now and again, you get to go through stuff. Sometimes it's a sometimes it's a more of a melancholy feeling where it's you know you've, um, a box of stuff that that uh, somebody who's passed away has left behind, and you're checking that there's nothing really important in there, and there's, there's all these things that are bits of someone's life that they wanted to hang on to. So that, you know, that's the sort of melancholy bit of the of the equation. But, but yeah, you know, sometimes it's in secondhand shops where you just there's a box yeah. of stuff, yeah. and you know, every everything's passed through someone's life at some point, so it's a that, you know it's it's a sort of invitation to imagine that kind of box of goodies, and baddies. I'm just I'm curious about your kind of home studio. Yeah. Setup. So when you first kind of started out, so you had the press, yeah. your brother. Yeah. And then how did you kind of go from there in terms of getting tired and ornaments and so, all your equipment? Yeah. Uh, I initially just was, I was buying bits and bobs of type off eBay, you know, for when it was coming up cheaply, without really knowing what I was buying. So there, were, you know, I've got a number of little sort fonts of uh, no use at all, made out of cheese, really bad. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I started to work out what I needed, you know, I, and, and then now I'm really careful not to just randomly buy stuff to go in a drawer. So I've got I've got a fair bit of stuff that I never use that might turn out to be useful someday. Um, but I try to I try to buy to reflect a need now. So when I started off on imagining letters, because I knew that I needed I knew that I wanted as as mentioned the single font for the whole thing. I therefore needed more more type uh, than I had in any single font. So I, I ended up buying a full case of modern number one from our friends at uh, the Whittington Press, um, which, I mean, it was quite a 
treat to have a, a whole full, literally brimming full type uh, case of case of this this type. So there's so there's that. How I started. I mean, initially the press went in the cupboard, and all the type went in the you know cupboard, of which there wasn't there wasn't very much at that point. And when I was when I was wanting to do typesetting, it was on the it was on the dining table and it all got packed away back in the cupboard by the time I'd finished, which was becoming untenable um, and, beginning to, and beginning to dominate. So uh, the, way, the way we had our flat set up, we had, the, we had the telly in the second bedroom. We don't have any kids. We had the telly in the second bedroom uh, with a spare bed. Uh, so we decided to move things around rather than move and, you know, and find a place which had the shed that is my natural domain. We uh, we we decided to move the flat around and uh, put all of the living room stuff in the one room. Uh, and my wife's got a, a big sort of craft table and whatnot in there. It's not not a total monster. Um, <laughs> and then you know, all the pretty stuff went in one room. And sometimes it is an absolute hellscape in there I should I should say sometimes there there is literally paper there are literally boxes and paper everywhere and um, you know I, I'm ashamed to show it to people but other times I try and keep it reasonably tidy so yeah it, it sort of evolved and now I yeah I try not to dominate the whole of our living environment with little bits of metal it doesn't always work I think also when you said, okay, to start with, you weren't necessarily in the book arts community. Right. But um, one thing I would say is that um, it, you were really proactive in becoming part of that community. And every time I'd be at a letterpress event or um, an artist book event, Tim would be there. You would find out what was going on. You would get to know people and therefore things have really grown you from that point I'm sure that now if you need to find out something or ask questions about type letterpress artist books you've got those connections that is true that is true it's a um, remarkably welcoming friendly community I have to say I mean yeah I had no I had no expectations but they've certainly been exceeded <laughs> I'm glad about that <laughs> <laughs> well um just for me to say thanks for being so candid Tim it's I think it's a real pleasure to have these kind of conversations with people and get a little bit under the surface of, of work that we can see in the cabinets that actually come out and you bring them to life thank you, thank you. Thank you.